Welcome back, friends. I am Annabelle, and I am here to read. Every week, first we sit down and read a work of classic literature together, and then we discuss it. If you would like to follow along down below in the video description box, there is a link to a free ebook. Down there, you can also find uh, links to source material, uh, links to the author's bio, things like that. And I should note that I do like putting content warnings down in the video description box as well, but I'm just gonna state up front that if you are unfamiliar with this work, it's real f***ed up. This week we are reading A Modest Proposal by Dr. Jonathan Swift. For preventing the children of poor people in Ireland from being a burden on their parents or country, and for making them beneficial to the public. It is a melancholy object to those who walk through this great town or travel in the country when they see the streets, the roads, and cabin doors crowded with beggars of the female sex, followed by three, four, or six children, all in rags and importuning every passenger for an alms. These mothers, instead of being able to work for their honest livelihood, are forced to employ all their time in strolling to beg sustenance for their helpless infants, who, as they grow up, either turn thieves for want of work, or leave their dear native country, or fight for the pretender in Spain, or sell themselves to the Barbados. I think it is agreed by all parties that this prodigious number of children in the arms or on the backs or at the heels of their mothers and frequently of their fathers is in the present deplorable state of the kingdom a very great additional grievance. And therefore, whoever could find out a fair, cheap, and easy method of making these children sound and useful members of the commonwealth would deserve so well of the public as to have his statue set up for a preserver of the nation. But my intention is very far from being confined to provide only for the children of professed beggars. It is of a much greater extent, and shall take in the whole number of infants at a certain age." who are born of parents in effect as little able to support them as those who demand our charity in the streets. As to my own part, having turned my thoughts for many years upon this important subject and maturely weighed the several schemes of our projectors, I have always found them grossly mistaken in their computation. It is true a child just dropped from its dam may be supported by her milk for a solar year, with little other nourishment. At most, not above the value of two shillings, which the mother may certainly get, or the value in scraps by her lawful occupation of begging. And it is exactly at one year old that I propose to provide for them in such a manner as, instead of being a charge upon their parents or the parish, or wanting food and raiment for the rest of their lives, they shall, on the contrary, contribute to the feeding and partly to the clothing of many thousands. There is likewise another great advantage in my scheme, that it will prevent those voluntary abortions, and that horrid practice of women murdering their bastard children, alas, too frequent among us, sacrificing the poor, innocent babes, I doubt, more to avoid the expense than the shame, which would move tears and pity in the most savage and inhuman breast." The number of souls in this kingdom being usually reckoned one million and a half, of these I calculate there may be about two hundred thousand couple whose wives are breeders, from which number I subtract thirty thousand couple who are able to maintain their own children, although I apprehend there cannot be so many under the present distresses of the kingdom. But this being granted, there will remain a hundred and seventy thousand breeders, I again subtract 50,000 for those women who miscarry, or whose children die by accident or disease within the year. There only remain 120,000 children of the poor parents annually born. The question, therefore, is how this number shall be reared and provided for, which, as I have already said, under the present situation of affairs is utterly impossible by all the methods hitherto proposed. 
for we can neither employ them in handicraft or agriculture. They neither build houses, I mean in the country, nor cultivate land. They can very seldom pick up a livelihood by stealing till they arrive at six years old, except where they are of towardly parts, though, though I confess they learn the rudiments much earlier, during which time they can, however, be properly looked upon only as probationers, as I have been informed by a principal gentleman in the country of Cavan, who protested to me that he never knew above one or two instances under the age of six, even in such a part of the kingdom so renowned for the quickest proficiency in that art. I am assured by our merchants that a boy or girl before twelve years old is no saleable commodity, and even when they come to this age they will not yield above three pounds, or three pounds and half a crown at most, on the exchange, which cannot turn to account either to the parents or kingdom, the charge of nutriments and rags having been at least four times that value. I shall now, therefore, humbly propose my own thoughts, which I hope will not be liable to the least objection." I have been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London that a young, healthy child, well-nursed, is, at a year old, a most delicious, nourishing, and wholesome food, whether stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled, and I make no doubt that it will equally serve in a fricassee or ragout. I do therefore humbly offer it to public consideration that of the hundred and twenty thousand children already computed, twenty thousand may be reserved for breed, whereof only one-fourth part to be males, which is more than we allow for sheep, black cattle, or swine, and my reason is that these children are seldom the fruits of marriage, a circumstance not much regarded by our savages, therefore one male will be sufficient to serve four females." that the remaining hundred thousand may, at a year old, be offered in sale to the persons of quality and fortune, through the kingdom always advising the mother to let them suck plentifully in the last month, so as to render them plump and fat for a good table. A child will make two dishes at an entertainment for friends, and when the family dines alone, the fore or hind quarter will make a reasonable dish, and seasoned with a little pepper or salt will be very good boiled on the fourth day, especially in winter. I have reckoned upon a medium that a child just born will weigh twelve pounds, and in a solar year, if tolerably nursed, increaseth to twenty-eight pounds. I grant this food will be somewhat dear, and therefore very proper for landlords, who, as they have already devoured most of the parents, seem to have the best title to the children. Infant's flesh will be in season throughout the year, but more plentiful in March, and a little before and after, for we are told by a grave author, an eminent French physician, that fish being a prolific diet, there are more children born in Roman Catholic countries about nine months after Lent than at any other season. Therefore, reckoning a year after Lent, the markets will be more glutted than usual because the number of popish infants is at least three to one in this kingdom, and therefore will have one other collateral advantage by lessening the number of papists among us. I have already computed the charge of nursing a beggar's child, in which list I reckon all cottagers, laborers, and four-fifths of the farmers, to be about two shillings per annum, rags included, and I believe no gentleman would repine to give ten shillings for the carcass of a good fat child, which, as I have said, will make four dishes of excellent nutritive meat, which he hath only some particular friend or his own family to dine with him. Thus the squire will learn to be a good landlord, and to grow popular among his tenants. The mother will have eight shillings neat profit, and be fit for work till she produces another child. Those who are more thrifty, as I must confess the times require, may flay the carcass, the skin of which, artificially dressed, will make admirable gloves for ladies, and summer boots for fine gentlemen. As to our city of Dublin, shambles may be appointed for this purpose in the most convenient parts of it, and butchers may 
we may be assured will not be wanting, although I rather recommend buying the child alive and dressing them hot from the fire as we do roasting pigs. A very worthy person, a true lover of his country and whose virtues I highly esteem, was lately pleased in dis discoursing on this matter to offer a refinement upon my scheme. He said that many gentlemen of this kingdom, having of late destroyed their deer, he conceived that the want of venison might be well supplanted by the bodies of young lads and maidens not exceeding fourteen years of age, nor under twelve, so great a number of both sexes in every county now being ready to starve for want of work and service, and these should be disposed of by their parents if alive, or otherwise by their nearest relations. But with due deference to so excellent a friend and so deserving a patriot, I cannot be altogether in his sentiments, for as to the males, my American acquaintance assured me from frequent experience that their flesh was generally tough and lean, like that of our schoolboys, and by continual exercise and their taste disagreeable, and to fatten them would not answer the charge. Then, as to the females, it would, I think, with humble submission, be a loss to the public, because they soon would become breeders themselves. And, besides, it is not improbable that some scrupulous people might be apt to censure such a practice, although, indeed, very unjustly, as a little bordering upon cruelty, which, I confess, hath always been with me the strongest objection against any project, how well soever intended. But, in order to justify my friend, he confessed that this expedient was put into his head by the famous Salman Azor, a native of the island Formosa, who came from thence to London above twenty years ago, and in conversation told my friend that in his country, when any young person happened to be put to death, the executioner sold the carcass to persons of quality, as a prime dainty, and that in his time the body of a plump girl of fifteen, who was crucified for an attempt to poison the emperor, was sold to his imperial majesty's prime minister of state and other great mandarins of the court in joints from the gibbet, at four hundred crowns. Neither, indeed, can I deny that if the same use were made of several plump girls in this town, who, without one single groat to their fortunes, cannot stir abroad without a chair, and appear at a playhouse and assemblies at foreign fire fineries which they will never pay for, the kingdom would not be the worse. Some persons of a desponding spirit are in great concern about that vast number of poor people who are aged, diseased, or maimed, and I have been desired to employ my thoughts what course may be taken to ease the nation of so grievous an encumbrance. But I am not in the least pain upon that matter, because it is very well known that they are every day dying and rotting by cold and famine and filth and vermin as fast as can be reasonably expected." And as to the young laborers, they are now in almost as hopeful a condition. They cannot get work, and consequently pine away from want of nourishment, to a degree that if any time they are accidentally hired to come and labor, they have not the strength to perform it, and thus the country and themselves are happily delivered from the evils to come. I have too long digressed, and therefore shall return to my subject. I think the advantages by the proposal which I have made are obvious, and many, as well as of the highest importance. For first, as I have always observed, it would greatly lessen the number of papists with whom we are yearly overrun, being the principal breeders of our nation, as well as our most dangerous enemies, and who stay at home on purpose with a design to deliver the kingdom to the pretender, hoping to take their advantage by the absence of so many good Protestants, who have chosen rather to leave their country than stay at home and pay tithes against their conscience to an Episcopal curate. Secondly, the poorer tenants will have something valuable of their own, by which law may be liable to a distress and help pay their landlord's rent, their corn and cattle already being seized, and money a thing unknown. Thirdly, whereas the maintenance of a hundred thousand children from two years old and upwards cannot be computed at less than ten shillings apiece per annum, 
the nation's stock will be thereby increased, 50,000 pounds per annum, besides the profit of a new dish, introduced to the tables of all gentlemen of fortune in the kingdom who have any refinement in taste. And the money will circulate among ourselves, the goods being entirely of our own growth and manufacture. Fourthly, the constant breeders, besides the gain of eight shillings sterling per annum by the sale of their children, will be rid of the charge of maintaining them after the first year. Fifthly, this food would likewise bring great custom to taverns, where the vintners will certainly be so prudent as to procure the best receipts for dressing it to perfection, and consequently have their houses frequented by all the fine gentlemen who justly value themselves upon their knowledge in good eating, and a skillful cook who understands how to oblige his guests will contrive to make it as expensive as they please. Sixthly, this would be a great inducement to marriage, which all wise nations have either encouraged by reward or enforced by laws and penalties. It would increase the care and tenderness of mothers toward their children when they were sure of a settlement for life to the poor babes provided in some sort by the public to their annual profit instead of expense. We should soon see an honest emulation among the married women, which of them could bring the fattest child to market. Men would become as fond of their wives during the time of their pregnancy as they are now of their mares in foal, their cows in calf, or sows when they are ready to farrow, nor offer to beat or kick them, as is too frequent a practice, for fear of a miscarriage. Many other advantages might be enumerated. For instance, the addition of some thousand carcasses in our exportation of barreled beef— the propagation of swine's flesh, an improvement in the art of making good bacon, so much wanted among us by the great destruction of pigs too frequent at our tables, which are no way comparable in taste or magnificence to a well-grown fat yearling child, which roasted whole will make a considerable figure at a lord mayor's feast or any other public entertainment. But this and many others I omit being studious of brevity. Supposing that 1,000 families in this city would be constant customers for infant's flesh, besides others who might have it at merry meetings, particularly at weddings and christenings, I compute that Dublin would take off annually about 20,000 carcasses, and the rest of the kingdom, where probably they will be sold somewhat cheaper, the remaining 80,000. I can think of no one objection that would possibly be raised against this proposal, unless it should be urged that the number of people will be thereby much lessened in the kingdom. This I freely own, and was indeed one principal design in offering it to the world. I desire the reader will observe that I calculate my remedy for this one individual kingdom of Ireland, and for no other that ever was, is, or I think ever can be upon the earth. Therefore, let no man talk to me of other expedients, of taxing our absentees at five shillings a pound, of using neither clothes nor household furniture except what is of our own growth and manufacture, of utterly rejecting the materials and instruments that promote foreign luxury, of curing the expensiveness of pride, vanity, idleness, and gaming in our women, of introducing a vein of parsimony, prudence, and temperance, of learning to love our country, wherein we differ even from the Laplanders, of quitting our animosities and factions, of being a little cautious not to sell our country in consciousness, consciences for nothing, of teaching landlords to have at least one degree of mercy toward their tenants. Lastly, of putting a spirit of honesty, industry, and skill into our shopkeepers, who, if a resolution could now be taken to buy only our native goods, would immediately unite to cheat and exact upon us the price, the measure, and the goodness, nor could ever yet be brought to make one fair proposal of just dealing, though often and earnestly invited to it. Therefore, I repeat, 
Let no man talk to me of these and the like expedients, till he hath at least some glimpse of hope that there will ever be some hearty and sincere attempt to put them into practice. But as to myself, having been wearied out for many years with offering vain, idle, visionary thoughts, and at length utterly despairing of success, I fortunately fell upon this proposal, which, as it is wholly new, so it hath something solid and real, of no expense and little trouble, full in our own power, and whereby we can incur no danger in disobliging England. For this kind of commodity will not bear exportation, and flesh being of too tender a consistence to admit a long continuance in salt, though perhaps I could name a country which would be glad to eat up our whole nation without it. After all, I am not so violently bent upon my own opinion as to reject any offer proposed by wise men which shall be found equally innocent, cheap, easy, and effectual. But before something of that kind shall be advanced in contradiction to my scheme and offering a better, I desire the author or authors will be pleased maturely to consider two points. First, as things now stand, how they will be able to find food and raiment for a hundred thousand useless mouths and backs. And secondly, there being a round million of creatures in humane figure throughout this kingdom, whose whole subsistence put into a common stock would leave them in debt two million pounds sterling, adding to those who are beggars by profession, to the bulk of farmers, cottagers, and laborers, with their wives and children who are beggars in effect, I desire those politicians who dislike my overture, and may perhaps be so bold as to attempt an answer, that they will first ask the parents of these mortals whether they would not, at this day, think it a great happiness to have been sold for food at one year old, in the manner I prescribe, and therefore have avoided such a perpetual scene of misfortunes as they have since gone through by the oppression of landlords, the impossibility of paying rent without money or trade, the want of common sustenance, with neither house nor clothes to cover them from the inclemencies of the weather, and the most inevitable prospect of entailing the like or greater miseries upon their breed for ever. I profess in the sincerity of my heart that I have not the least personal interest in endeavoring to promote this necessary work, having no other motive than the public good of my country— by advancing our trade, providing for infants, relieving the poor, and giving some pleasure to the rich. I have no children by which I can propose to get a single penny, the youngest being nine years old and my wife past childbearing. The end. If you're not quite as online as I am, there's a internet axiom law, which is relatively new called Poe's Law, which basically states that no matter how incredibly over the top, just bananas you think you're being, somebody is going to take whatever you say with absolute sincerity and think that you're being completely serious. And apparently that's what a lot of people thought about A Modest Proposal. A Modest Proposal the full title of which was A Modest Proposal for Preventing the Children of Poor People in Ireland from Being a Burden on Their Parents or Country and for Making Them Beneficial to the Public, was initially published in 1729 by Dr. Jonathan Swift. This was a couple of years after Gulliver's Travels, but he initially published it in an anonymous pamphlet because he kind of knew what he was saying would not be taken too kindly. A Modest Proposal is kind of the work you talk about when you're talking about satire. Satire is poking fun at something specifically for the point of making it seem ridiculous in order to poke fun at it in a form of like social commentary. It differs from parody because parody can just kind of be fun. Like when you think parody, think of like Weird Al. Although sometimes Weird Al has a kind of strange way of making social commentary unintentionally from like a meta perspective. Okay, they asked me, I said no, but yeah. under the parody law, I couldn't stop it. And satire 
generally has a specific point of view that it wants you to adopt and it has a specific thing that it's commenting on. Think like, oh my god, I almost said Liz Lemon. You better fix this, nerd. Think of Tina Fey when she was doing Sarah Palin on SNL. I can see Russia from my house. <laughs> well, SNL is a very good, um, it's very frequently satirical. Anytime they're talking about political figures, it's usually satirical. There are obviously some people mostly probably landlords because he really went in hard on those landlords who understood that he was poking fun at the idea of eating children as a way to increase the kingdom and all that kind of thing. But in Swift's time, this was a very hot topic, uh, both kind of how, how you provide for the poor. Um, Ireland in specific was for a very long time thought of as just kind of I, like, I, I don't know how to say it in like a kind way, but they, they were just kind of looked on Irish people, especially Catholic Irish people, were not looked on very favorably by, uh, by the Protestants who were generally the ones in power. My favorite part is the part at the end where he starts saying, well, if you don't like this, please, by all means, don't suggest this and this end this because th that's just craziness unless you're actually gonna do it <laughs> and that's actually a rhetorical device like something that you use in speech writing called apophysis where you affirm something by way of denying it and in using it here it's kind of brilliant because he actually suggests a whole bunch of things like hey you can tax landlords more for their income on rent that could be a solution for, you know, not leaving people stone cold broke, maybe. And th this is one which kind of blows my mind, other than the very like specific Salmanazar references. This could have been written today because it touches on a lot of political hot topics, which are still weirdly relevant today. So, so maybe maybe we should think about taxing landlords. But no, we won't talk about that. So I hope you enjoyed this classic work of satire. If you did, make sure to rate it a thumbs up. And while you're down there, subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss next week's work of classic literature. Hope to see you then.